I'm going to speak to you a bit about the history of people with disabilities, what they've done in the world, what kind of work they had in the world, and the history of the disability rights movement, which I've suggested has changed everything for all of us in today's world. As I mentioned in my previous lecture, even though I had a significant impairment, which limited my capacity to carry out some of the essential tasks of daily living, to use the language of the World Health Organization in its definition of disability, I did get to go to school. I was born with six fingers altogether and one quite short arm. Now, no one else in my family had a disability until, of course, they were very old, and my own impairment was very unexpected when it came into my family when I was born. Many, indeed most people with disabilities, are alone in their families. Now this is different from other groups that are considered minority groups or groups that are protected by civil rights laws in modern times. For example, most women and girls live in families with other women and girls. Most people from racial or ethnic minority groups live in families where there are other members of those groups. But for disabled people, they're often orphans in some ways in their own families, meaning that we are different in group status and often in our physical or cognitive characteristics from other members of our families. Now, other social minority group members that are often not like other members of their families are people who are gay, people who are lesbian, people who are transgendered, or people who are adopted across racial and ethnic lines. There's a long history of how people with disabilities were understood and lived. One of the oldest stories or records about disability is the story of people with very unusual bodies who were considered in ancient times to be monsters, and more recently, who are considered to be freaks. These very unusual people were considered to be messages from the gods or omens from some divine source. People with very unusual bodies were considered to be wonders that people often traveled very far to see, to read, and to study for the messages that they thought these bodies contained. For example, in the 18th century in Germany, there was a man born legless and armless. And he developed skills as a calligrapher, someone who carries out beautiful writing with a pen or a brush. He was also an expert marksman, and he was an entrepreneur. His name is Matthew Buchinger, and he was very famous in his time, and he was very rich. If you were a person with a disability before the end of the 20th century or the 21st century, there were very limited economic opportunities for you as a person with a disability. And you very often had to be very resourceful, like Matthew Buchinger, the armless calligrapher and expert marksman was. In the 19th century, people with 
interesting and unusual disabilities like Buchinger sometimes displayed themselves in museums or in what we called freak shows. They were often celebrities, famous entertainers, that were part of 19th century celebrity culture. Very small people like Charles Stratton, who had the stage name General Tom Thumb, made a very good living. In fact, they were more or less rich at a time when there were very few jobs or opportunities for people with disabilities. The famous entertainer, P.T. Barnum, charged admission for the wedding of Tom Thumb, or Charles Stratton, and Lavinia Warren, which was held in Grace Cathedral in New York. And many people came because they were such celebrities, and people were eager to see them and to attend their famous wedding. People with disabilities worldwide can lead good lives in a way that people with disabilities in the past could not. This is because the civil and human rights movements changed attitudes about people with disabilities and the lives that we lead. The civil and human rights movement of the mid 20th century begins in 1948 with the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights. This is a very important document that comes out of the devastation of World War II, but specifically it comes out of something that happened in World War II that is very specific to disability and to human rights. So many people, of course, die in World War II as the totalitarian regime of the Nazis takes over and causes devastation throughout Europe and throughout the rest of the world. But what also happens in the Nazi era and in the Holocaust is that people's rights are violated because they are tortured, because they are experimented upon, because they are locked up or incarcerated against their wills that they are not given the opportunity to consent to what it is that happens to them. They are stripped of autonomy and the freedom to make decisions and choices about their own lives. And so the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights that Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of Franklin Roosevelt in the United States, supported and worked toward, along with many other people. We are all agreed, I'm sure, that the Declaration must be approved. This Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 lays out a very complicated and a very comprehensive definition of what human rights are and that all humans should have these same rights. So it's a very important document that suggests human equality. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights.
The Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948 is about then, in the end, the dignity and the worth of the human person. And so this Declaration of Human Rights, this Universal Declaration that was written and that was taken up by many nations worldwide, gave us a set of liberation movements in the 20th century, in the mid 20th century that followed World War II. And these rights movements across the whole world were rights for racial justice, they were movements for the rights of gender justice, the women's movement. They were movements for the rights of people with disabilities. For example, in the 1970s and 80s, many, many people with disabilities took to the streets protesting the barriers that existed and the exclusions that existed and the segregation that existed widely across the United States and the world for people with disabilities. There's a wonderful photograph of a protest by disability rights activists in which people with wheelchairs and canes and all sorts of disabilities were protesting and they're holding up on the streets a banner. And that banner says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And this is a quote by Martin Luther King one of the leaders of the black civil rights movement in the United States and worldwide. And what this picture illustrates, when we have people in wheelchairs, people with disabilities taking to the streets and protesting and demanding their rights and holding up a banner that has language from a leader of the black civil rights movement, is that these movements for justice and desegregation and equality crossed all groups and worked together in the US civil and human rights movements and the civil and human rights movements worldwide. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 comes to us several decades after the civil and human rights movement and the disability rights movement in the early 1960s and 1970s brought forward legislation in the United States that helped integrate people with disabilities into places that they had been excluded previously. We have laws such as the Architectural Barriers Act of 1968. The government said, if you get federal money, you have to make your buildings and your organizations accessible to people with disabilities. Well, in 1968, architects and designers didn't have any idea how to make buildings and spaces accessible to people with disabilities. But because of laws like the Architectural Barriers Act of 1968, there was a incentive for architects and designers and builders and the world in general to make the world accessible for people with disabilities, to take down the barriers that had kept people with disabilities out of full participation in public life. In the mid-1970s, there was a very important set of laws that came forward that desegregated schools and education. These laws said 
that every student had the right to a free and equal and appropriate education. And this changed the educational structure of the United States, opening up schools to people with disabilities in a way that schools were never open to me or to people with disabilities like me before the civil and human rights 